Welcome to Thrive. It's good to have you here. It's good to be here, and it's good to have you here. And um, we are just so thrilled uh, to be able to be able to worship together. And uh, welcome to those who are online with us this morning. We have started a new series called Identity just a couple of weeks ago as we kind of walk through the Gospel of John. And we are finding how many, well, first of all, that the Gospel of John is unique in the fact that there are more one-on-one -on -one intimate conversations with Jesus than in any other, other Gospels, these dialogues that go on that we could kind of have a sneak peek as, a, as the fly on the wall in these. And um, most of the dialogues that happen in the Gospel of John do wrap around the idea of identity who Jesus is, but also who the individuals are. Are they their background, their race, their uh, gender, their, um, their work, their past history, their culture? Who am I is the big question that's being asked along with who is this Jesus? And it's the interaction between the two that makes the difference for these individuals. Today, we're going to be kind of going to the absolute other extreme from last week. Last week we were in John chapter 3 and it was a story of Nicodemus who was at the top, the apex of the uh, ladder or the pyramid. Now we're going to the bottom to uh, chapter 4. And I think John deliberately puts these two chapters next to the, each other. And today we're going to be looking at a Samaritan woman who remains unnamed and she's about as low as you can go in that society of that day. But unlike Nicodemus, who never quite gets it from what we can tell, she identifies who Jesus is as the Messiah, as the Christ, when he identifies with her. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, Samar a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, we have, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. You've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. An amazing dialogue. Amazing. The woman, like I mentioned, is at the bottom of the social pyramid of her day. 
She is unnamed. She's a female. Those are two strikes against her already, we find from this text. She is a Samaritan, which is this heretical, as the Jews consider it, mishmash group of mixed race lineage, and who had become enemies to the Jews when they came back to the promised land after the Babylonian captivity, it was some Samaritans who tried to defy the Jews and cause trouble for them. And since that day, they hated them. They despised them. They'd have nothing to do with them. And she herself, within her own community, was at the bottom because of her past associations with five different men and now the person she was living with. Everything about her is the absolute opposite of what we saw last week, Nicodemus, who was at the top. Now, what I'd like to do is um, I've kind of shared with you uh, this new series called The Chosen that you can watch um, and stream online. And I think of all the episodes, this interaction between the Samaritan woman and Jesus at the well is one of the best scenes that I've seen in the whole two years of there. So we're going to watch a section of this video now and then come back and start working through the text. Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come at noon in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I'd, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Long story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah, exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? 
I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him, even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. That it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sorts this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know. But not by the Messiah. <sighs> and you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. You promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> Hey, wait! <laughs> your water! You forgot your um. Foxy, your man, you told me everything I ever did! <laughs> yeah, that is uh, one of the best scenes I would recommend uh, watching. It's free, you can get the app. Um, and uh, watch it on any device you can think of. And um, that was one of the most powerful scenes. And it's really a question of identity. So we're going to be looking at these three points now from the text. That is thirsting, receiving, and, and overflowing. First of all, thirsting. Now, uh, what's really amazing in this dialogue that we saw kind of displayed in a dramatic fashion before us, but in the text itself, it seems like it's almost a non sequitur. So Jesus comes, he's thirsty himself, and then he says, I can give you water. I can give you water that you will never thirst again. And um, the Samaritan woman says, please give me such water. And then he says, go get your husband. And she goes, I have no husband. And you're going like, How did, why did he change the topic? Do you understand? They were talking about water, and now it's all of a sudden about relationships and what kind of a relationship he, she has with these different men. It's like, what, what's going on here? What ties those things together? 
And I think what John is trying to tell us is something that I think we recognize, that everyone is actually thirsty, thirsting, craving, desiring something, something to complete us, to fill us. And we drink in whatever we can, and yet we're still thirsty again and again and again. Um, it was St. Augustine years ago, you know, well, years ago, I guess so, because he was like 400 AD. He said that human beings are not rational creatures. We kind of know that we, don't, we think a lot, but we're not that rational. He said we were desiring creatures. We have desires, and we're trying to get them fulfilled. And he basically said our souls are restless. We're always desiring and thirsting after things, trying to find that which will fill us. Um, so this woman was looking for her identity in all the wrong places. She had been used by five husbands. Um, she was working on a sixth. She was still thirsting, maybe even more so than ever before, and yet she was still going back to the same old, same old, trying to find it there, because where else should, would she go? But I don't think we should fault her any more than any of the rest of us, really. Right? You know, it's really amazing because I think it's pretty young that we realize not only that we have a need for other people, but that we want other people to like us and to find. You know, it's back in middle school, actually, where we start uh, seeing that we're trying to be around the right types of people. Have you ever noticed? It's about middle school where you're trying to find your tribe, and it becomes very tribal. It's even worse than high school, actually. And so if you are liked by the right people, then you are somebody. And if you're not, then you're a nobody. And somehow we buy into it already back then. Basically, what we're doing is we're using people to worship ourselves. Now, the myth of finding that right person, the, quote, soulmate myth, keeps going on. Sorry, uh, John and Corinne. You, uh, you probably, in one sense, you married the right person. And in a lot of ways, you will find out you married the wrong person, too, at the same time. It happens to us all because God uses the fact that the other person cannot fully complete you. Right? Well, I, I, we don't have to go into the details right now in any of our relationships. But you find out that the other person cannot be the end all and be all. You're trying to find in another human being what only God can actually do. And, and we do that. It's amazing to me. But, you know, hey, it makes a lot of money in our society. Why, why do you think all those princess fairy tale movies in Disney, what they're really all about, right? Most of them are somebody is going to come in, rescue me, and complete me. Um, but then there's also the one that really just I'm puzzled at is why in the world is the Bachelor, Bachelorette whole series still on the air when hardly a relationship lasts a year after all of that stuff? Have you ever noticed that? Is it because we like to watch other people suffer or we think that they're actually going? What, what it, why, why does it make money? I don't understand. It's saucy. <laughs> Yeah, that's maybe one word for it. I think Esther Perel um, put it very well about our desires, our thirsting to find our identity in some other human being and completion. She said, we come to one person, and we basically are asking them to give us what once an entire village used to provide. Give me belonging. Give me identity. Give me continuity. Give me transcendence and mystery and awe all in one. Give me comfort. Give me edge. Give me novelty. Give me familiarity. Give me predictability. Give me surprise. Desire, thirst, identity, searching for it. It's not that we just want to be loved, but we want to be not only lovable, but we want to find in someone else the fullness of what we can. And we look to another flawed broken human being who is also desiring and thirsting for the same thing and expecting them to fulfill what we can't fulfill either. We're not really looking for partnership or compatibility or love or even romance. We're really looking for a savior. So the Samaritan woman was haunted. She was thirsty. She was looking 
for identity in all the wrong places. And Jesus basically says to her, okay, so let's talk about relationships, you know? Let me tell you that what living water really is. What you've been looking for from one man after another, but you haven't found, is what I can give you freely and fully. And I don't believe that John just records this story in John chapter 4 simply because it was a great event and the Samaritan woman came to understand who the Messiah was, but also for us. And he's basically saying to us through this story, Jesus is looking at us and saying, you know, you're all desiring things. You're always wanting. You're always craving. You're always looking for more, for comfort, for wholeness, for a solid identity, whether it's in sex or romance or money or power or status, you won't find it there. Maybe you don't even realize you're thirsting, and most of your life you're looking for to quench that thirst. You can only find it when you're connected to me. I'm the one who can give you that living water. So we're all thirsty like this Samaritan woman. And we can all be receiving what the Samaritan woman received, our second point. Now, I don't know if you realize this. Maybe you do. In the Middle Eastern society of Jesus' day, and it kind of comes up in the video, um, there was a huge social hierarchy, okay? And um, the Samaritans were pretty far down on that scale. Uh, they were hated and despised. And if you were, um, but along that scale as well, you've got, um, also a moral hierarchy, not just an ethnic and racial and not just patriarchal hierarchy. Women were below men in that society in that time. But if you were a good person or a law-abiding person or a person who tried to be pure, you were much higher than those who broke the laws or did not keep themselves ceremonially pure, etc. And as she mentioned, the temple itself um, if you would go to the temple, the one place that they were told in that day you can worship God, there was an outer court of the Gentiles, then there was a court for the women, then there was a court for men, and then there was the high priests and the priesthood that could go into the actual temple. There was all these higher, which if you look in the Old Testament, God never set it up that way, but by the time the New Testament rolls around. The priesthood had kind of made this hierarchy, and guess what? She couldn't even get into the court of the Gentile. Samaritans were not wanted at all in Jerusalem, period. And I'd say, dare, uh, dare I say, we might not recognize it, but today in our society, we too have a social ladder. Some of it's sometimes based on race, sometimes it's based on economics, sometimes it's based on um, degrees after your name. But we also have an understanding that good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people to an extent. And if something bad happens to me, I say, well, I'm a good person. How in the world is this happening to me? And, but we still are playing that game. And what's shocking about this story is that Jesus deliberately breaks through and goes to the bottom rung of their ladder in that day and age. Um, so the beginning of the text, I don't know if you, um, when we read through it, you probably go, oh, OK, um, and didn't think through it. But it said in John 4, he left Judea and departed for Galilee. So Judea's in the south, Galilee's in the north. And guess what's in between? Samaria. And so it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. That's not quite true. In fact, most Jews would not ever pass through Samaria. They'd walk around it. Yeah, it'd be longer. But they would go over towards the Jordan River and then go up north to Galilee. They'd come from Galilee and go down the Jordan River and then come back up into Jerusalem. They would avoid Samaria at all costs. John is saying here that he had to pass through Samaria because he had chosen to meet with this woman. 
I think that video said, hey, do you think it was by chance that I happened to be in Samaria on this day, in this place, at this time? At an hour and a time when nobody would be expected to be at the well? He chose. He had to be there. And so we find out what Jesus does is shocking, purposefully, deliberately shocking. He was going to meet with a person at the lowest rung of her society, morally, racially, and gender-wise. Receptivity, receiving, is really not about you. It's the fact that God has made his move in Jesus Christ and taken the lowest place, the place nobody wanted, the place everybody's trying to get away from. He takes the position of a servant, and not just a servant of some people, but a servant of the worst people, of the least likely people. He comes not just to our level, but below our level, in a sense, so that no one not this woman, not you, not me, could ever say, hmm, well, you know, he might be for, he's for everyone. Yeah, Jesus did meet with people who have high society. We saw that last week with Nicodemus. But if that's all he ever met with, you'd probably go like, yeah, well, that's good. He's, he's for the nobility, but I'm, I'm just kind of a peasant. But Jesus deliberately chooses his own birth the father chose Mary, the poorest of the poor. He chose Nazareth. He chose Bethlehem. He chose the manger. What's shocking about this story is all the choices that Jesus makes in order for you to receive him. There is no ladder with God. That's um, a word in Christianity. We call that is grace. It's all a gift. A gift that you receive simply because God wants to give it. You know, um, a wage, a salary, there are ways you can um, not receive it, right? One is you don't show up to work, you don't get paid most of the time. <laughs> or if you do a bad job, you might get fired. But with grace, with a gift, what stops you from receiving it? The only thing that could ever stop you from receiving a gift is pride that says, no, I don't want your charity. But that's it. Humility or need, thirst, and Jesus saying, here, I'm going to give you living water. That shows just how receptive he breaks down all barriers, he comes to a point where he takes the lowest place so that he can give to you so that you can receive everything he is and everything he has and never question whether you are worthy or um, whether he wants you. He absolutely does. And this story is one of those focal points that points that out. So from thirsting to receiving to how he describes it, overflowing. You know, um, this woman does not uh, buy into some concept or get a new philosophy or uh, seven habits for highly effective people. She doesn't receive a set of moral virtues or a 12-step procedure. This woman is actually stunned, as you saw in that video as well. She leaves her water and runs back into the village and cries out, <clears throat> not, oh, come read a book, or hey, I got a new insight, or I've got these new values, or there's a seminar you need to go see. But he, she says, come see a man who told me everything I'd ever done. Could he be the Messiah? And you might say it sounds strange, but what she's really saying is, come see someone who knew me at my worst who offered me his best. A man who doesn't care about race or gender or status or moral standing or wealth or anything else. Nothing got in the way. He's not about temples. He's not about places. He is about spirit and truth. And that is her new identity that she receives. 
Jesus is saying, I've got what every human being has been longing for. I will not simply satisfy you, but you will be so filled with the Spirit that you will, your whole heart, soul, mind, and who you are will be filled with joy and you will become personally alive. You will know you have a personal relationship with your Creator, the one who has created you, the one who redeems you, the one who forgives you, the one who knows you better than you know yourself, the one who is bone of bone and flesh of flesh, who absolutely is intimately involved in your life through and through, who embraces you and even takes in the hurt and the shame and the guilt and everything else that's broken in your life and says, you are mine and I am yours, period. And for Jesus to do that, what's amazing is just 15 chapters later in the Gospel of John, the one who says, I can give you water that will, nev that will make you never thirsty again is the one who is hanging then on the cross and cries out, I thirst. I thirst. And I don't think he was just thirsting for a little water for a parched tongue. He was dried up in his relationship, his intimacy with his father at that moment. He had lost it all. He'd given it all up. He was dying of thirst for good, for God, for you. So Jesus experiences what we would call the ultimate thirst so that he can become the water of life that flows through you completely. Now, you might say, well, that's great, but you know, sometimes I'm still thirsty and not just physical, but I feel lonely and I have uh, difficulties and I'm looking for more and I, I feel somewhat empty and it's like, yeah, I get that. I do feel lonely at times, but I am never alone any longer. And I do still struggle at times, but I don't do it alone. I think um, it was uh, Paul who put it well in Romans chapter 8, what Jesus also gives us. He says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that, order that we may be glorified with him. Yeah, there is still suffering, there's difficulties in life, but the one thing the Spirit will keep telling you is, you are a child of God. You are beloved. You are wanted. You are accepted. You are an heir. You are his through and through. I love how C.S. Lewis states it, God's intentions and how he will fulfill it one day. He says, he will make the feeblest and filthy of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright, stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though, of course, on a smaller scale. His own boundless power and delight and goodness. That's you. That's the Samaritan woman. Dissatisfied, discontent, thirsting, we can receive what Jesus offers today so that we too overflow with the Spirit. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you this day. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came for this woman. And as you came for her, though she remains unnamed and though she was at the lowest of the low and though her life had been a broken series of uh, bad relationships, Lord. We thank you that you received her and welcomed her, and therefore we know that you welcome us. We pray, Lord, as St. Augustine had said, you know, our, we, are, we are always restless until we find our rest in you. We are always thirsting until we, our thirst is quenched in you. We are always dissatisfied until we find our satisfaction in you, Lord. And that's what worship really is, to say, Lord, you are are all in all. You are the one who calls us your very own. You've made us yours. We thank you, Lord, that you fill us with your amazing grace, that you are the one who has done it all for us. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us more deeply and more profoundly what our identity is in you, that throughout our lives we discover more and more what it means to be your child, your sons and daughters, that the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are your children 
and not just children, but heirs and co-heirs with Christ, that everything he has, he gives freely to us, and we thank you for that. Lord God, we do lift up many situations in our world today. We think of all those who have fled Afghanistan, who have faced the tragedies of that war, Lord God, and for the refugees that are on their way, both to the United States and elsewhere, that you, Lord, that not only they find a house or a shelter, but a home and a place with you, and that you would use us Christians around the world, Lord, to welcome them in, to be hospitable to those who have um, lost so much. We lift up to you, Lord, our brothers and sisters and others in New Orleans, Lord, and in Louisiana. We pray, Lord, um, that you not only keep them safe in the days ahead, but draw them into deeper fellowship with you and through uh, their needs right now for shelter and food and 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 uh, all the basics of life, Lord, that you would help, uh, that you would move your church to so serve so that we can show who you are to them, Lord God, and draw them to you. We lift up to you, O Lord, Brooke, and we pray your healing upon her foot and bless Hunter and Brooke and uh, baby Knox, Lord, with your love and mercy and grace this day. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd be with our campus ministry and with all the students as they are, um, well, got a couple days off uh, with the Labor Day weekend. Bless them, Lord, and whether wherever they are, whether watching online or at home or with family, Lord, that whatever they're thirsting for and desiring, that they realize their desires are fulfilled by you. Lord, we ask that you would um, grow this ministry as you see fit, that you would use us according to your will, that you would draw us uh, to be all that you want us to be in this community, in this world. And um, you know right now how COVID is still affecting our society in so many ways. You know how some have gotten sick and others feel isolated. And Lord, we're still trying to figure out how uh, to serve in such an environment and at this time. We pray that you keep us safe, but also that you move us out in wisdom and compassion to serve others. So for these things, uh, we lift up to you this day and we commend ourselves into your care. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the identity that we have in you, Lord Jesus, our Savior. In your name we pray all these things. Amen.